No one who looks at the facts of life can look very far without encountering not only extreme disparities in outcomes, but also the pervasive reality of luck. Some may think of luck in terms of being born rich or poor, black or white, or any number of other social distinctions. But luck extends far beyond such conventional social categories, right down to the individual level. No one can choose what kinds of parents to have, or whether to be the firstborn or the lastborn in a family, much less what kind of surrounding community with what kind of culture to grow up in. Yet such wholly fortuitous factors, from the standpoint of the individual, can have a major influence on how one's life turns out. As already noted, a study of American prison inmates found that most were raised either by a single parent, 43%, or raised with neither parent present, 14%. It was pointed out elsewhere that those children who had a parent who was imprisoned ended up in prison themselves several times more often than members of the general population. Similarly, in Britain, a study found that 27% of prison inmates had been placed in protective child custody at some point while growing up. If we have no control over luck and no control over the past, then it is all the more important that we concentrate on those things over which we can at least hope to have some influence, notably providing incentives affecting future behavior. Income is an obvious incentive, and because it is an incentive affecting economic behavior at all levels, we cannot treat incomes as if they were just numbers that we can change to suit our wishes, without considering how that will change behavior and the economic consequences that follow from behavior. Such consequences of changed behavior affect the output on which the standard of living of a whole society depends. Nor are those economic consequences something that we can conjure up from our imaginations or deduce from our preconceptions. The hard facts of history can tell us something, and current factual tests of our hypotheses can tell us more. The same is true of incentives affecting crime, including both law enforcement and punishment. Here, perhaps even more so than with economic issues and incentives, utter ignorance of relevant facts seldom seems to inhibit sweeping and passionate conclusions. Many people who have never encountered the kinds of dangers inherent in law enforcement do not hesitate to say that excessive force was used against someone resisting arrest or even someone threatening the police. People who have never fired a gun in their lives likewise do not hesitate to express shock and anger that so many bullets were fired in an encounter with a criminal. On a personal note, as someone who was once a pistol coach in the Marine Corps, I have not been surprised at all that large numbers of shots were fired in such situations. Even when an overwhelming force of police arrive on a threatening scene, bringing the threat to a complete halt without using any force at all, critics often call that overreaction to the threat, which never reached dangerous levels. The possibility that it never reached dangerous levels precisely because of an overwhelming police presence never seems to occur to such critics. As regards punishment, a criminal's unhappy childhood cannot be changed, and whether the person he has become can be changed is by no means a foregone conclusion. Nor are the dangers he represents to other people's safety or their lives, dangers that can be banished by saying soothing words like rehabilitation or alternatives to incarceration. This is not simply a matter of our choices, but of our inherent limitations, what we might choose to do if we were omniscient is no guide at all to the painfully limited choices we may have when we are very short of omniscience, and when negative unintended consequences have become so common as to become a cliché. If and when rehabilitation gets beyond being a word and becomes a demonstrable fact that can be relied on in the future, then its benefits can be weighed against its costs, like anything else. These costs include the inevitable failures that go with any human endeavor, and the costs of such failures extend beyond economic resources to lives lost. As for good luck, that too is part of the irrevocable past. 
But awareness of the role of luck might temper the arrogance of some who have been successful and temper the resentments of others who have been unsuccessful and who seek boogeymen to blame for their condition. Boogeymen who can be readily supplied by politicians, leaders, activists, and the media. Since there is nothing easier to find than sins among human beings, individuals can always be found who have said and done bad things, and can thus be more or less automatically blamed for the bad outcomes of others. Beyond that, there is always the fundamental fallacy that outcomes would be equal or comparable in the absence of malign actions against the less fortunate. Here, as elsewhere, the only times over which we can reasonably hope to have any influence are the present and the future. The most we can do with the past is to learn from it. Efforts can be made to reduce the number of people currently likely to have damaging childhoods, but the outcomes of such efforts depend not simply on how fervently we wish for better results, but on our knowledge, resources, and wisdom, none of which is available in unlimited supply, and deficiencies in which can lead not merely to failure, but even to counterproductive outcomes, extending to major social disasters. At the societal level, the same severe and painful limitations apply when seeking to redress the wrongs of the past. Where the deaths of both the victims and the victimizers put them completely beyond our power, our frustration cannot justify making symbolic restitution among the living, when the costs of such attempts around the world have been written in blood across the pages of history. After territorial irredentism has led nations to slaughter each other's people, over land that might have little or no value in itself, simply because it once belonged to a different political jurisdiction at a time beyond any living person's memory, what is to be expected from instilling the idea of social irredentism, growing out of historic wrongs done to other people? Such wrongs abound in times and places around the world, inflicted on and perpetrated by people of every race, creed, and color. But what can any society today hope to gain by having newborn babies in that society enter the world as heirs to prepackaged grievances against other babies born into that same society on the same day?